Hey guys, boy have I got a big one for you today. In this video, I interviewed the legendary hunchy Patrick McCarthy. So last week I was at the Koryu Chinati Kenpo Jutsu Sohonbu Dojo in Brisbane where I had the chance to train with my KU brothers and sisters and, and we did a lot of hard training and, and enjoy some fun and laughter and some food and whatnot. Now I also had the honour to interview Hunchy Patrick McCarthy. For most of you he needs no introduction but for the rest he's the world's number one karate historian. He's the collator of the Bubishi and a pioneer of application based karate including the habitual acts of physical violence theory the kata evolution theory and also bringing Tegumi to the world which paved the way for other prominent karate people like Ian Abernathy, Jesse Enkamp and Vince Morris. He was a competitive champion, he's the leader of the International Ryukyu Karate Research Society, an author, a very sought after seminar instructor and I'm honoured to say my sensei as well. Now you're going to want to strap in for this one, you need a pen and a paper and get ready to pause or rewind because there's a lot of content. So, without any further ado, it's my absolute honour and privilege to introduce Hunchy Patrick McCarthy. It's an absolute honour to have uh, Hunchy uh, here with us today and uh, take some time for me to pick his brain and ask him a few questions. So, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, Hunchy. My pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. <laughs> oh, actually, we're having you. Yeah. This is Homo yeah. Dojo. Welcome right. to Brisbane. Yep. It's not your first time here, so. That's right. Uh, I'm not sure what you have planned for me for question-wise, so we're we're kind of winging this. Uh, I... uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So I wanted to ask you, first of all, uh, you know, you often talk about your BFO as the blinding flash of the obvious. That's when, uh, for those who don't know, that's when the light bulb goes off and, and you get that sudden realization. And I wanted to ask you that uh, prior to you coming with, up with some of the deductions that you have as you were learning through Richard Kim and Kinjo Hiroshi and those people, what were some of the biggest BFOs for you? What was the big light bulb moment for you? We, uh, the, the acronym itself, BFO, came about, uh, uh, you know, you have one epiphany after another. And then, you know, I, I have that type of personality where I, I like to I like to come to see the best with the funniest and everything if I can, you know. It's a, um, and I thought, standing there one day, working in Tokyo, uh, and you may remember I was a sparring partner with. Uh, well, in those days we were called UWFI, uh, the head of our uh, gym, uh, which was the Snake Pit in those days, was uh, Takata no Kiko. We were basically catch wrestlers. Uh, he would then move on and purchase Pride, and uh, and then go on to uh, continue his career in MMA. I, of course, took the job to come to Australia and uh, ended my days there. But being in the stable with those guys, uh, you know, and working outside of the traditional world, I was constantly shaking my head in disbelief watching these catch wrestlers, submission fighters, if you will. Um, you know, they, you know, everybody lived together, but you know, so they, you know, in the morning they do the road work and they come back to the, the gym and weight train or hit the bag or do their daily training and everybody gather for lunch and take a rest in the afternoon, watch some fights, uh, talk about special techniques and so on. And then, and then in the evening after training, I. I'd see, and we were not in a cage in those days. This is late 90s, or uh, sorry, late 80s, early 90s. I would see them doing movements by themselves, uh, for the lack of a better description, the kata movements. And I would say, guys, I thought you didn't know anything about karate. They go, oh, so what am I just give them? I don't know what you're talking about. I said, oh, you know that you're doing these moves. That, that's obviously a move from a kata. That looks like naihanchi. Well, that my my favorite, of course, was the basai dai. You know, and I said, "That's basai dai for God's sake!" Wait, what do you mean you don't know kata? He goes, 
Oh, Patrick, I have no idea what you're talking about, but really all we just did there was uh, I'm in a clinch, uh, and to support my uh, balance so it's not deplaced, I put a grapevine around, which is uh, my leg hooking around your leg, and then as I, I do an overhook with one arm, I'm shoving your face back like this, Instinctively, it's easier to shove a hand rather than pull, agonistic versus antagonistic. So I shove your hand off, I hit you with the elbow, I wrap the arm around your neck, I now have you in a semi-guillotine, and then I force the hand up like this, and by the time it gets, I don't even get it to 12 and you're tapping or you're falling asleep. And so these types of epiphanies, um, during that I like to refer to it as a very embryonic period of my uh, study. Mm -hmm. Just kept adding up and kept adding up and kept adding up. And it was like, you know, so, like the so called straw that broke the camel's back. I find him, it can't be this easy. Now, this is all during the years that I'm looking to better understand the depth of kata and uh, uh, how, and this is before I stumbled across the Habitual Act of Physical Violence Theory, supported by two-person uh, practices, i.e. eliminate the defensive contextual premise, ritualize it into a solo composite, mm -hmm. and then by virtually linking those uh, composites together, you got something greater than the sum total of their individual parts, and therein lay, or lie, uh, what the kata truly represented. So it never really meant to teach you anything. It certainly culminated the lesson you should have already learned in a two-person application drill, yeah. and and uh, so so those types of epiphanies led me down a pathway, led me outside the traditional world of karate, allowed me then to explore the depths and the ambiguity of the Chinese arts, Southeast Asian arts, and then the next epiphany, as I remember really quite clearly, was um, you know I had to wrestled in high school as well and uh, uh, I was uh, out uh, on a trip and a, and a friend of mine was from Estonia and I remember him talking about the great wrestlers, Hackenschmatt and those type of guys and, and uh, I remember thinking, oh I have a book in my library that's uh, written by a guy named Hans Tellhofer was an old guy and, and uh, who'd done uh, medieval uh, compilations on uh, uh, different Western fighting arts, you know, rapier, blade, dagger, uh, buckler, but I wasn't so much concerned with the weapon arts as I was with the grappling techniques. And then, of course, there was Nicholas Bedler as well, who would, uh, like Tell Hoffer, had also done some medieval uh, compilations on understanding those. So when I started looking at those Western-style fighting arts, Although the, 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 the garments were different, and certainly the hairstyles and stuff like that, I said, you know something? These postures are not much different from what I was looking at when I was looking at Kōryū, uh, Heihō Jitsu, or, or the old Jiu-Jitsu schools. And I remember specifically uh, Kanoji Goro's uh, book on Jiu-Jitsu, 1895, uh, before Irving and Hancock and those people. And I started contrasting the figures in there because remember it wasn't motion picture then, although Path of Pacific has changed that for us, but yeah. they were photographs. And I was starting to contrast those with uh, uh, these uh, Western, and I said, yeah, I'm just going to kind of pull a rabbit out of a header. I'm going to go look at some of the old Greco Roman stuff and the, the pan creation. And you know, presto, all of a sudden I started, I just, it just happened, it was like that, be, I, at work, and I said, you know something? This is like a blinding flash, you know. I'm supposed to, I'll, I'll be obvious for God's sakes. It's, we only have the arms and legs and irrespective of the, uh, the color of our skin and the language and culture, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the mechanics uh, uh, of, of our ability to move are governed by the same immutable principles. And that was that, that, was that moment and I was just went, oh, very well. And so it was from that time that I kind of, it was the last I was, because I kept clinging on. It had to be, you know, first it had to be my style. And then it had to, well, at least it had to be Japanese or, and oh, it came from Okinawa. So, oh, it had to be Okinawa. And then I, I went to Okinawa, but it wasn't there either. And now I said, well, it all comes from China. So I went to China, you know. 
Fujian, Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, and oh, well, Shaolin Temple. Well, then with the Shaolin Temple, and you know, I mean, I was so uh, enthusiastic. I was so crazy about this stuff. I remember uh, at one point around uh, around 1989, 1990, um, a colleague of mine was an archaeologist. Said, uh, "Ah, you would be really fascinated to find out what they've just unearthed in Egypt." Uh, it was a discovery made some many years ago, but they're just now re-investigating. It's called the Beni Hassan Temple Tomb. It's, uh, you know, one side of it, there's a complete, uh, they dug it out, there's a complete uh, uh, illustrations of a fighting art, uh, and there was all kinds of uh, occupation, weapons, and so on, but I was principally concerned with the empty handed side. What do I do? Get on a flight. <laughs> Fly to Cairo. Uh, take the boat down the river, get off at Elmenia, take the camel ride in, just to stand and look at the stuff. That's how crazy I was about stuff like that. And, you know, it's funny now making the deductions based upon that abstract. It was so difficult for me to look beyond the obvious. And now in hindsight, everything's, everything's simple in hindsight. And it's funny, I, I often um, get a kick out of my detractors who, you know, uh, it's kind of like the Arthur Schopenhauer three stages of two, three, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, when you uncover, and I love Joseph Campbell's quote, you know, uh, every generation produced people who, in an effort to keep their traditions a living contribution for the community that they serve, uh, reinterpret the common uh, principles upon which the tradition rests. And in spite of the lip service paid to my style is better than yours, uh, it's just more innovative ways of doing the very same thing. So when you if you're bold enough to introduce something that's kind of a new way of doing an old thing, for enemies right away, uh, according to Machiavelli, you're going to have all those guys who have fared well in the old ways, mm -hmm. but now that you've tended to supersede, uh, you know, Occam Razor, if you will, Kiss, to find a simpler way to achieve the same competency, you're going to be uh, uh, ridiculed, you know, and or, or opposed, and then and then finally in the end. Uh, the opposition and the ridiculing doesn't work, and depending on what the nature is, that can also become violent as well. Uh, if they go to the next one, which is self-evidency. Ah, oh, we know it before him. And it's amazing how many people know the stuff that I brought forward before I did it. Type yeah, of thing. Yeah. You know, oh, that was completely obvious. And I suppose one of the great things about the internet these days is everything's time coded, so it's not so difficult to, to look backward to say it didn't. I, I get a real kick out of there's a guy out in uh, U, the UK who who was a. Uh, I, I was at a seminar one day teaching some techniques and go, oh, I, I, I learned those from so and so. He was the founder of Tegumi, and I went, <laughs> oh, it's wonderful, you know. So they say imitation is uh, some form of flattery. So yeah. anyway, I may have jumped off the topic a little bit, but Epiphanies, BFOs, yeah, it was a pathway like the Pied Piper, the breadcrumbs, you know. Yeah. Although uh, not well planned out, but the end result. And I got to tell you, if I could just say one more thing for for your students who are going to be listening to this, um, you know, it, it's interesting uh, when you make a discovery and you think, I mean, I'm a Canadian kid from the east coast of Canada, not anything special or anybody special that I would be able to come up with something that would help change the way people look at yeah. the, an older tradition. I mean, I, I almost, I can remember in the early stages, I'm like, well, I, gotta, I better not tell anybody, <laughs> you know, I better kind of keep that to myself because, you know, that's not a good thing to do. And by the time, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there was an executive member of the World Karate Federation, who's also president of the Australian Karate Federation, who recruited me to come to this country. You know, he had the eyes to see in those days. He said, McCarthy, he's, you know, this guy is way ahead of his time. He's got some stuff that's really going to help us change the way that we look at this. I can remember being a little bit apprehensive about being so out of the box in those days yeah. because I realized if I was saying, you know, look at the, you know, in my studies, tradition is not about, you know, hiding the master's ashes in the, in the box or, you know, according to the studies of the old school that I have looked at and, and quoting Newton, standing on the shoulders of these giants, i.e. reading and studying their work. Tradition wasn't about that at all. Tradition was about continuing to study that which the pioneers were, were seeking to uncover. Yeah. And that constant 
ability to generate something new from something old is what tradition represented. So, but that's not what the common uh, understanding is within those other traditions. Yeah. It's always conformist base. If you're not doing what you're doing, you know, we're going to have a word with you type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it probably leads really uh, well into my next question, which is, Koryu Tanadi is it's sometimes criticised as, as being against Japanese karate or modern karate. Uh, we sometimes get this, you know, your, your karate bashing or Shotokan bashing or whatever it is. So, if your contribution is predominantly in the area of application-based um, karate, the direct question would be, are you against sport karate? Oh my goodness, no, not at all. I mean, beside the fact that many of my best friends are are world leaders in the sport of karate, and that I spent the first 20 years uh, mad and passionately chasing my identity on the tournament floor. Uh, if, if someone's telling you Patrick McCarthy's not, uh, or is doesn't like sport karate, you, you tell them that they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. I think if it had not been with the sport of karate, uh, we probably wouldn't have this conversation today. Yeah. So, sport karate, but 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 let let's keep things in in, in context as well. Uh, there are two sides to this coin. One is the art, and the other is the competitive arena. Mm. Uh, karate can also be several other things. It can be a wonderful lifestyle. It can be a a, a form of self defense. Uh, in fact, as you well know, going through our instructor training program, one of the questions on it is, are what are the five things that it can be? Uh, you know, it, it can also be an industry. My joke used to be was, maybe it was the oldest industry, but then I realized, no, no, it might have served to protect the oldest industry. <laughs> Jokes aside, uh, no, my goodness, no. Uh, uh, sport is, uh, you know, any any form of adversarial training, and, and really, look, at the the essence of adversarial training is not really fighting another person, yeah. unless you're looking in the mirror, you know, that's where the real enemy exists. But no, I'm, I'm not, I'm a, a very pro-sport, uh, and I'm very familiar with all the arguments, oh, look what happened to judo, and, you know, I, I understand that as well. But no, I, I really believe that if, if there is any medium um, best suited to deliver our tradition, uh, to a wider audience, and if it's not sport, please come and show me what it is. Yeah. So, no, I, I'm a bit ab advocate of it, but, but at the same time, I'm keeping the balance. At my age, certainly my fitness level these days, the sport of karate is not my principal interest. Yeah. Um, but I'm very interested in working with the sport, yeah. and I have wonderful liaisons with the uh, uh, sport leaders around the world. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. So we, oh, sorry. You uh, you asked something about you know because Ku uh, sorry Kuruchi Nadi acronym uh, focuses a lot on application practices. You've yep. been criticized for this and that. Not sure. First of all, um, and other uh, in Okinawan karate. Uh, here, let me kind of clear up that myth for everybody. <clears throat> There's really no such thing as Okinawan Karate. Karate is the product of the uh, Japanese Budo community during the 20s and 30s. From around 1917 until December of 1933 when the Dainippon Patokokai ratified and sanctioned a brand new Japanese tradition called Karate Do, not the styles of it, just Karate Do as a generic practice. There were, there were eight or nine people who came up from the mainland, haphazardly with the exception of Funagoshi Gichin, who was actually physically invited up. Let me just see if I can remember them off the top of my head. I wasn't practicing this for the interview today, but uh, we would have had uh, Matayoshi Shinko, Gima Shinken, Motobuchoki, Funagoshi Gichin, uh, Mabuni Kenwa and Miyagi Choji came up in 28, Chitoshi Tsuyoshi, Toyama Kanken, and uh, uh, Uechi Kang uh, Kanbun. Those were the nine best known. There, there are others, but those are the best known uh, who would then leave a footprint on the sands of our tradition, uh, a meaningful footprint, as I will, uh, haphazardly introducing their interpretation of this highly eclectic uh, and symbiotic uh, uh, foreign practices, foreign fighting practices that were. Uh, 
uh, introduced to Okinawa over a very long period of time by lots of different people and for lots of different reasons and some of which have felt quietly dormant and other people have never even will never know that once existed largely from Fujian uh, province China uh, uh, but also from Southeast Asia and so on so you know without a big dissertation you know after Japan made the tradition uh, the transition from feudalism into uh, modern times so let's leave it like that Oh, my no, not at all. You get, for coffee, we kill. Are you kidding? <laughs> Seventh down. Thanks, Peter. Okay, we're talking a little bit about something that's so important, but it's either overlooked, ignored, sadly not even understood by most people. Those nine people who came to the mainland haphazardly uh, offered ins instruction in something that would uh, uh, become ultimately very popular. You know, my teacher's Kinja, well, was my Okinawan teacher's Kinja Hiroshi, who died, you know, in his 90s. I can remember something he said to me many years ago. He said, you know, no one, more than we Okinawans, were surprised that this, that this uh, practice, this discipline, ever became as popular as it ever did. It, it, just, it was uh, mind-boggling. But it was the Japanese and the weight, the political weight of Japanese Budo culture, largely Kendo and, and, and Aikido, uh, sorry, uh, Kendo and Judo, through the Dynamo Kokai, that influenced these uh, Okinawan individuals to look at wearing a gi, uh, using the Dan Q system, adopting the belt, changing the ideogram that referred to something foreign, i.e., Chinese. I don't need to explain what the discriminatory issues were between Japan and China at the time, excuse me. And then finally, to get rid of that Chinese ideogram and get rid of the jitsu or the application facet to become more in line with Japanese Budo culture and what we call, uh, what's now called Michi or the Wei, which is, uh, this is something that a lot of the listeners will not understand, but I would implore you to look it up if you get a chance. Something called Shu Shin, uh, Koktai Hongi and Nihonji Rong. Nihonji Rong means the uniqueness of the Japanese people. Uh, Koktai Hongi means national polity. And, uh, well, actually better, better said as Meiji no uh, Koktai Hongi, which was the Meiji period base of uh, uh, national polity. And Shushin, which means uh, a blind worship of the emperor, you see? So during this period of radical military escalation, uh, they had transformed, and by the way, I mean, you know, in, in Okinawa, uh, in the old schools, I mean, grappling, what is referred to today as the clinch, uh, fighting down or up, or percussive impact, head, elbow, hello, all widely practiced in two-person drills in the old days. But those are not things that were interested uh, by the Japanese during the period of time during this transitory migration. You know, Jiro and Jiu-Jitsu handled the grappling, so there was no need for that. The, the Japanese had the sword, there was no need for weapons. I mean, really, when you look at what karate represented, it was really a little more than just the punching and kicking and the kata, you know, yeah. which would then serve as a an adjunct uh, uh, for, uh, to, for physical fitness and social conformity, which would serve the war machine. So when we talk about, okay, he's all going to have a karate, karate is a Japanese tradition. It's just, just as simple as that. That it has roots in Okinawa, and that, that, that Okinawa was a melting pot for other traditions coming in from China and Southeast Asia and so on. See, that's the, that's the wonderful thing about Onko Chishin, yep. studying the old to better understand the new. So when people would say to me, oh, that's not to his... You know, they, they, you know, they really don't know what they're doing. They, they don't know what they're talking about. And interestingly enough is, when people further get down the path uh, to realize that they, the, des the destination is not the goal in the first place, it is the journey, they kind of lighten a little up on the, taking themselves too seriously, you know, and uh, I, it, it's all, I'm always, I always welcome the detractors who want to come back online and say, you know, I should have listened to you 20 years ago or something, you know, and I, what I found really fascinating is a lot of those detractors from, say, the 90s and, or, you know, early 2000s, who, who vehemently uh, criticize me 
are now being complimented for doing the very same thing, yeah. by the way. So yeah. anyway, so. And, uh, and that's that's true. I mean, it's become a very popular uh, pastime now, whereas obviously back then it was fought, and now it's become the new trend, uh, those application practices. Um, the question I wanted to ask is something that's pretty obvious to me uh, as a, um, a Koru Chinati follower and follower of your movement. Uh, it's pretty obvious to me, but there's some others that might be watching that it's not quite so obvious to. For those that don't actively follow um, Koru Chinati as a stylistic uh, um, art form, uh, and I'm careful with those words because obviously we're, we know that it's not a style, it's a, it's a, a collection of concepts and principles. Uh, but for those that don't uh, follow that movement per se, what then becomes the value in the IRKRS for those people that maintain their existing stylistic expression? I didn't even ask him to ask me these questions. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. He did ask me in the earlier, but do you want to read the questions? But because we're in the middle of a gush, I didn't have time, but great question. Uh, okay. If I lose my train of thought, bring me back, okay? Sure. It's interesting. When I started, my very first seminar, uh, uh, was I was still living in Japan. Terry O'Neill, Fighting Arts International, remarkable martial artist and just a beautiful human being, um, calls me. I had been writing for his magazine back in those, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And anyway, long story short, he invites me uh, to England. My very first seminars are thanks to uh, Terry O'Neill. I'm ever so grateful for that early recognition. That said, you know, people in those days, were, they never saw this stuff before, and there was mixed emotions and, and uh, mixed opinion, of course. But most people say, what's this style? What is that? What's that style? What's this? And I go, look, it's just a kind of a collection of my independent research in an effort to find a link back to, uh, you know, back to the future, if you will, uh, to coin a phrase. And, Oh, yeah, 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 but what's the style? And my God, they wouldn't <laughs> let off. And I tried the best I could do for one or two years, you know, to say, nah, it's, a, it's just a collection of old stuff. You know, because as soon as I said it was Shotokan or Shito or Gojo, Rue, Rue, or, and then it would have been none. Then anybody, and I knew that too very well. I was very mindful of, as soon as I said it was this, everybody else would hate it, who weren't that. Yeah. And as long as I kept making sure it was generic, everybody would be fine with that. Yeah. Because everybody was having BFOs, you know? The Shoto, Shito, Waro, Gojo, everybody was going, wow, this, oh, that's uh, this, oh, that, you know, that's uh. And so we were all happily living in bliss at that time. And I remember talking to Kinjo Sensei about it. I said, yeah, that's a, oh, it's a kashi this name, yeah, but he, ah, sorry, uh, yeah, that's a very troublesome, I don't know what to do. And he said, and he said, ma, so, kono, monda ni tsu te aru, uh, to, uh, in, uh, I have a great solution for this issue. I said, what is it? He goes, well, just tell them what it is. It's uh, old school practices. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, he said, in the old days, we used to kind of refer to ourselves as inside people, you know, uchina to uchinan, namas people. Uh, uchinan is the same writing from for the Okinawa see. And especially, you know, Okinawa was living outside uh, in Hawaii or South America would use these terms. Uchinanchu. Uchina is the abbreviation, and te, and we know te in the old days referred to the fighting arts because we remember Junsoku, uh, father educator from Nago uh, in Okinawa back in the 17th century, had a wonderfully famous quote brought to us by Nagami Shoshin back in his early uh, uh, books uh, translated by Shinzato Katsuhiko Sensei, and it said, It's not enough that your character and that your fighting is strong, but it must be reflected in your daily behavior. And so they, and he was working with troubled youth at that time, and he used to use the martial arts or the fighting arts uh, in the same way that the, say boxing, for example, in ghetto was used as a vehicle to, to become a better, stronger individual, find yourself if you were. And so I thought, Uchi na te. Ah, oh, no, that's not good. Uchi na te is not good. Doesn't sound good. He goes, like, what? And Kinto Sen says, Uchi na di. You know, yeah, that sounds good. And he goes, if it's old, we say ko. And if it's a stream, we say ryu. Ko ryu. Uchi na di. That's great. 
But I remember at the same time, I was also, uh, as you know, I'm a swordsman from the Tenshin Shoden Katori Sento Ryu, Sugi no Ha. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, I remember the Koru community, they're very, you know, they're very sensitive about, you know, people, you, oh, another fake or phony, you know, oh, geez. I couldn't come up with a better way, you know, and but so I wanted to make it perfectly clear that this is not from the 19th century and yeah. handed down through a Mokuroku, uh, through uh, some Jigiden tradition to get, and I'm like the 27th head master or something. I said, no, I said, this is me taking old school practices yeah. and systematizing them into a, a fundamentally simple to deliver system. Yeah. And uh, and the koru in this part is not meaning ancient art in the traditional sense, the way Japanese koru is. It's merely meant as a label, an, a, a descriptor, if you will, that uchinari that we're doing is not style-based. Yep. It's old-school-based. And I went, that's great! They're really going to go with this. That's fantastic. And, and so, as soon as I said, <laughs> we're probably going to use our style, koru uchinari. Oh, my God. Then it was, uh, you know, the, the where, where's the headquarters school in Okinawa? Where's it? And, you know, some people who would, who knew my background, they, they knew where I'd been, where I'd done. They followed it since the time from the 60s, the, the tournament floor, the 70s, the dojos, the research, the translate. They, they were good with that. But it was the, you know, the guys who knew nothing. They, you know, they, uh, they but they had an opinion on everything, you know. Yeah. And I was a bad guy, and that's not what my you know my teacher told me and that type of stuff. And and so and then one guy, oh no, his teacher's Okinawa, and then but they realize, oh my god, he's in Okinawa, but he lives on the mainland of Japan. <laughs> what would he know about Okinawa? And you know, of course, Mr. Kinjo was probably until the time he died at, at nearly 95 years old, was one of the most revered uh, uh, old school practitioners, you know. And um, and only now is the depth of his. Uh, you, know, I hear what he said to me, Patrick. I don't exist. Don't, I'm not interested. Yeah. I'm passionate about this, and of course, you know, he wrote more books in the latter part of his life, simply because of the pressure, than he ever did when he was a younger man. Anyway, the 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 the, the moral of the story, if you will, is this. Koru Uchinari was never meant to be a style of karate, ever. It's still not meant to be a style of karate. Yeah. It's meant to be a systematized body of application practices linked back to the habitual acts of physical violence, which know no politics. They don't belong to in Taekwondo or Gojuru and Shut. No, there's because of the human body, its unique function, common anatomical weaknesses. This is what can be done to it. And then if I look at what's being done to it, I can say, oh my goodness, your limbs can be used like, le uh, I can use leverage with it. Category one, two, three levers. I can use your spine. If I, if I throw it on a body and pounce on you and grab your head from behind, I can make it like a category one lever. And the other five inches, the other four of the five inch machines, the wedge, the pulley, the fixed axle, this is how the human body works. Mm -hmm. And then those principles that support this applied science, they're not made by me. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we should call ourselves Isaac Newton Rue, or, or uh, who said it best? Give me a place to stand and a fulcrum and I'll move the world. Archimedes. Archimedes. So why aren't we calling Archimedes Rue? So these principles, these acts of physical violence, they've just been around since human beings have been around. And as long as it's on this planet, it's always going to work the same way. Now there are variables, you know, age, size, gender, all that type of thing, you know. And those are the variables in application practices. But the two-person drill phenomenon you learn it in passive resistance. And for anybody who doesn't follow that, I, I don't really care. I, yeah, I used to care, you know. I yep. was like, in my youth, I used to care. Well, the older I got, I didn't care. And on this age, I, they're not talking about me in the first place. Yeah. I don't care that they don't support it. Yeah. Let me put it another way, because we're talking about safety. The nature of what we're doing is, is physical brutality. It's violence, okay? So, but let me change the, the context for a minute. Let's say that you were a, a, a parent and you had a young child male or female, and it was time for uh, your child to learn how to ride a bicycle. It's not the 50s anymore, you don't sit them on and shoot them down the hill and say, hey, how, about, how you doing, you know? Now we get the little elbow pads, the hat, the, you know, we the little training wheels on the trike or the bike, whatever, and the empowering conversation, oh, no, Judy, you're looking, oh, my, oh, you're doing it. And then, you know, after, you know, you can't tell what the length of time is before a child gains the competency to go without wheels and, and you know, go around the block with no hands. But that pathway uh, is the learning process, okay? 
and that's why you work with your child and in the same way that in physical uh, 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 competencies you use passive resistance to gain a familiarity now once the familiarity is gained then it's a gradual to exponential investment of aggressive resistance mm -hmm. to test the veracity and that that of course with line drills oh yeah it's like Kramer in karate and you know I love the one <laughs> here I'm taking karate now I'll keep beating me but I'm gonna get that guy and by the time they all go down and see Kramer it was like that seven-year-old kid who was beating him up right Everything works against a seven-year-old kid, to everything, you know, or everything works against passive resistance. And don't forget, <laughs> quoting the very wise and Zen philosopher, Mike Tyson, <laughs> everybody's got a plan to get hit in the head with the left hook. The aggressive resistance becomes the study. Mm -hmm. The failure, the mistakes become the lessons. Uh, funny how pain has a thing doing that, right? But you're still working under relatively controlled circumstances as you continue to escalate with the... So, the, of course, the ultimate, if you just follow the breadcrumbs down, is to be able to gain functional uh, spontaneity uh, or functional competency without knowing what the guy's going to do, you know. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, now, I'm so happy, at least with one thing with the MMA world, is that... Um, you know, when you go to a BJJ doge or uh, sorry, BJJ club or a, a MMA uh, gym or something like that, because everything is resistance based. Uh, you know, the guys that are rolling on the ground or just standing up doing cage clinch or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, they're testing the veracity of their function immediately. Yeah. They don't have a solo representation, of course, like we do. You know, and hence the art versus the sport. You know, and uh, but something about that tells you right on the spot that's not working yeah and I God, I, the you know the internet and YouTube is dotted with <laughs> okay attack me go ahead attack me go ahead just throw a punch me no not that fast oh no no that, go ahead yeah no that's no no throw it no, yeah and and then once it gets here there's this big conversation about the 300 things that you're capable of doing and it's, it's, it's sad really. yeah. but interestingly enough people are still buying into that yes yeah, so. anyway Coruchinati is a systematized body of practices that can fit Really, in my opinion, under the uh, foundation of any tradition, breathe life into it again, make it highly functional and totally empowered without ever risking uh, damaging its uh, cultural heritage or legacy, and certainly not uh, uh, damaging its uh, uh, cosmetic appearance of the style. So that, in a nutshell, is what, and it's interesting, you know, I, I, I see folks say, we'll say Shotokan, I forget, I see people study Shotokan, but they won't practice another style. But they'll happily take up, say, uh, Matayoshi Kobudo, mm -hmm. or Yamaniru Kobudo, or Rukyu Kobudo, you see? So there's no problem having Kobudo in the dojo with Shotokan or Shitoru or Gojuro. Uh, I'd like to say to those people listening at home, there's also nothing wrong with taking Kobushinari in like you would take Kobudo, and it's no threat to you. It's a way of empowering an otherwise a tradition that no longer has functional applications to the kata that have been passed down in your tradition. And that's what they yeah. wanted to say. And then to circle that out, is it fair to say that the IRKRS as a organization is the academic backing that underpins that Kuritanadi movement? So that provides the historical context and the biological studies and so forth. I have a student in Quebec Comment ça va, mon ami, ma vraie? <laughs> Regardez ici, s'il vous plaît. He came to our seminar first in Montreal. And he was, whoa, I want to do this. <laughs> he went away on a vacation, I'm not going to say where, and he bumped into somebody who was from his own old style, who showed him a couple of things, and he came back, oh, I'd much rather do this from my style than do the, 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 the ridiculously long two-person practices of Koruchinati. And I thought, I read that and I said, I thought he understood. You know, learning a 50 or 60 or 70 move two-person drill is not, that's not the purpose of the drills. The purpose of those very long, long drills are to culminate the individual lessons that you would have learned on a daily, weekly, and a monthly, and possibly even a year. It usually takes around two or three years maximum to learn 
the amount of techniques and traditions and, and combinations and variations on a common theme. Just give an example for it. Let, let, let's say uh, a, a clinch uh, against a wall or a desk or whatever variations. A big person can do this, a little person can do this, uh, be, but because of those circumstances, you might have to do something else. So we might work a, a say, one type of, say, under the arm, a front clinch or bear hug, if you will, or from the backside, but whatever it happens to be. 20 different ways from Sunday with all kinds of variations, although the central theme remains the same. So you might have worked that for a week, two weeks, three, a month. You might have worked, you, you might have gone away on a vacation, come back. You will always still work that. But once you have, you've gone through the learning process and then you've gone through the, uh, the practice, the, you know, to get rid of it, to make it yours, then what can you, you can train. So if you say do, uh, for example, our Kansetsu uh, Waza, which is a joint manipulation limb entanglement, yeah, there are 72 parts to that drill. But if, say, you didn't know it yesterday and I taught it to you today, that's not the purpose of the drill. The purpose of the drill merely culminates the weeks and months of practice that you should have done. So when I hear somebody, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. you know, it, it, it's that they, once again, they've misunderstood it. Yep. And I say, take the time to spend a little bit more time on reading. You know, there's that wonderful Bunbu Ryodo. And all of the pioneers, Miyagi, Funagoshi, Mabuni, they all said, you know, if your art is just physical, it's going to be reflected in your attitude and behavior. There's no question about it. You know, might's right. And, you know, and, and usually it's very short lived as well. You may five years or 10 years and all I practice is that shit's no good type of thing. But find me a person who balances their physical training with, uh, and I don't want to say, when I say non-physical, I don't just mean academic or scholastic or intellectual, but I mean philosophical, holistic, pedagogical. The things that, uh, I love Carl Sagan had a great, uh, the, the late astronomer had a great uh, definition to the word uh, intelligence, that which there is to know. There's no end to learning, you know. And interestingly enough, the more you learn, it's like reading a book a second or a third time, you go, oh, jeez. I never got that the first couple of times I read it. So there's always something else to learn. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of keep shaking my head against people who won't take that in. Mm -hmm. And another thing, just while we're on the theme, and, and I know we got to get, how's the yeah. time, by the way? Uh, we're at uh, 124. No, oh. sorry, one time difference. Two. Oh! We have plenty of time. We're good. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing about this is, is, is this stuff is, you know, it's a, uh, do you ever hear a guy, oh, I, if I would have known that when I was younger. Yeah, they always said, oh, uh, you know, if it's real estate or investments or banking or girls or whatever, you know. Yep. If I'd have known that when I was 20, I'd have never done that. You know, yep. hindsight's better than foresight. Folks, I'm telling you, you know, I'm not trying to force you into anything. I'm just telling you this. If I can see any further down the road, it's by having stood on the shoulders of giants. I... You know, when I was still young, in my 30s, I did the unthinkable by going outside my style and starting to explore, cross-train. Bruce Lee was a big influence. Uh, that didn't sit well with a lot of people, and I've been attacked by everybody. I, at one time, I thought somebody, people were giving out a prize, you know. Uh, my detractors were so adamant at one time, if I could walk on water, quoting the Iron Maiden, it's because the bastard can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> I got it from everybody. Yeah. Those folks are all pretty silent now, though, you know, just yeah, yeah. many of them are doing what they were criticizing yeah. for. But look, the International Rukib Kanate Research Society really started off as a very small little group of people, uh, like-minded, Interested, all from different traditions, yeah. interested in pursuing the same common goals, and we got together, and and we were we were a group that uh, my original guys came out from the Japan Martial Arts Society JMAS, and I was asked by those guys back in the early days if I would become the admin, but I, I mean I have nothing against you know Aikido or you know Koru Joe and stuff like that, but I love it actually, but I just wanted to focus my attention morally on uh, with karate and the Rukyu uh, fighting arts. And so that gave leaving there, which and that tradition, that organization felt quietly dormant anyway, led me to ultimately form our group informally. Yep. And it really wasn't until I came to Australia 
But I mean, you know, Joe Swift, Mario McKenna, all those guys are very well known researchers. They are all my original members from Japan. Yeah. Uh, and then as I, I came here in 1995, I opened it to, to basically I opened it to Australia. And then, of course, in May of 1996, when we went online, I opened it to the world, thinking, oh, yeah. you know, in 30 members, or sorry, well, I don't think we had 20 members, to tell you the truth, in, in total in Japan. You know, because it's very transient, a lot of foreigners coming through with Japan in and out for one or two years doing post-grad work or something like that. In academia, we never had them for a long period of time. Yeah. And uh, so then 20 people would become, you know, 200 people and then 2,000 people and, and now 20,000 people in 50 countries, you know, so it really, it really exploded. A lot of people are interested in what we do. And that's what the IRKRS does. It's a... It's an organization that brings like-minded people together in pursuit of common goals. That, that's what we do, by the way. It just so happens to also be the parent organization for Korutsunari. Yeah. And a lot of people get that mixed up from time to time. And, and actually, it's, it's, uh, the Korutsunari part is the smallest part. It seems to get the most uh, exposure, but it's the smallest part. Most of all of our members are not from Korutsunari. They're from Shodokan or Shiru Goju or something yeah. like that. And, and we have colleagues all over the world who are who embrace our uh, practices uh, to strengthen the tradition. I'm conscious of time, uh, yeah. so I just had one final question, if yeah. that's okay. You you spoke before about that uh, wonderful quote about standing on the shoulders of giants and that was us to see uh, further down the road. Um, and I think back to uh, how you would see Kinjo Sensei and those before him as, as the giants for you. Um, and obviously for us that are following your movement, you know, I've had um, people come to me online and say, oh, I love your stuff. And I go, well, same thing, right? So that's attributed to yourself and Kinjo and everybody before me. Um, so for, for people like myself and the other Koryu um, brothers and sisters, that giant is yourself. Um, so my question is... Thank you, is, by the <laughs> way, for saying that. No, thank you for the caring and the sharing. That really means a lot to me. And I, I want to tell you something. I, I kind of grew up, I was very lucky to grow up with the instructors I had, you know, uh, my early judo coach was a, a remarkable person. My high school wrestling coach was a, you know, it was always about the athlete, you know. Uh, Richard Kim, you know, I fought with a guy tooth and nail, but he brought the best things out from me. Kenjo Hiroshi was the same thing, and Wally Jay was my jiu-jitsu instructor. And, you know, um, I always took great pride in saying, uh, I learned this, uh, by the way, this practice comes from Professor Wally Jay. He's still on my shoulder right now. Hello, Richard. I always cite the source. Yeah. I, but I mean, but I grew up not expecting to. I was just taught that's good manners. It shows good breeding. Yeah. Uh, now a lot of my, I mean, I don't do that every day because of my students all know where it came from. But when I see people out there teaching the stuff that I popularize and that learn directly from me, and then passing it off as if it was their own. I have a problem with that. Yeah. Now, admittedly, it's a pet peeve, okay? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't usually publicly say things about it, but I gotta tell you, I mean, you know, that says more about their character than it does about anything else. And I think, you know, so I gotta shake my head. There's a lot of those guys out there. One that I know is really popular, started his entire career pushing my stuff. Yeah. Nowhere do I see uh, us being recognized. And I see that as a character flaw that we threaten their insecurities because it's kind of like this in the business part about what we do, the commerce part is like, well, uh, if they knew it came from Pat McCarthy, uh, what's stopping them from going to him directly is what I think yeah. about it. But isn't this, I mean, let's just hypothetically say, you're my teacher and but you've been exposing me all, and you tell, oh, that came from Wally J, that came from Richard King, that kind of thing. And I go, ah, fantastic. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind to meet those guys and certainly get a lesson with them if I have a, uh, the, the good fortune to do so, but I'm not leaving my teacher because, uh, man, this guy is such an open-minded guy. Uh, thank you for being so open-minded. And that's the way I think. And so when I see it the other way, I just go, why? Yeah. Sooner or later, you know, I'm somewhere teaching this, I'll say, la, la. And so when I started developing these Tegumi drills and actually taking the name Tegumi out from lost annals of time and then and then massaging it to fit these two-person drills because tegumi is not the two-person drill. Tegumi is an old form of grappling used in Okinawa. But, you know, I use it as a name to, because of what te and gumi mean, to label this systematized body of crossing hands. If you know, yep. you know. But now look at the word tegumi is uh, commonly part of our trend, you see? Yep. But when you look up tegumi, I don't see 
anything this is uh, Patrick McCarthy, uh, thanks to his research, brought this back in. Yeah. And then the coattail jumpers have used that to forward their own campaign, so to speak. Does that make sense? Or yeah, that sounds no, too no. self-serving for me? No, no, absolutely. It makes complete sense. And and, and I guess for me, that's important. And, and I do see that not happening a lot. you know. And as I'm trying to work through my journey, it's important that I remember to continue to do that and, and cite the source. Um, I, sorry, my apologies for interrupting. I always thought remaining connected to the source ensured continued growth in the future. That was the way I grew up. You know, it's like uh, if I graduate, <clears throat> if I got my degree in this, I graduate. I, it doesn't mean I got to send money back to my professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences or something like that. But I'd like to stay connected to the alumni, for example. I mean, who knows uh, what I'm going to learn 20 years down the road from other discoveries that are going to be. It's just, for me, it's just common sense. Yeah. All those guys, all those what kind of ones I met, the Japanese, uh, uh, great guys. Well, <laughs> there may have been one or two <laughs> bastards, but, but they're all basically nice people. Eat, break bread, have a drink, socialize, talk, train, interview, always happy to share things. I never had a problem with any of these guys. And if somebody said to me, I have a responsibility as well. And if somebody says, you know, I want to follow this research, I always say, what for? What do you mean, what for? Well, are you looking for a functional competency, like, say, self-defense? Or a cultural recreation, or just a pastime? Or, yeah, I mean, what do you want from it? You know? Oh, I see. I mean, I live in a really dangerous neighborhood. I won't, won't want my. Okay, well, y'all might not want to go with that tradition then. Yeah. Because that tradition focuses largely upon this pathway. Mm -hmm. And that pathway handed by that generation, this generation, this generation, they don't embrace practices that example what goes on in reality. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I'm able to then quantify it, they go, oh, I see. So thinking about how, as I mentioned, standing on the shoulders of giants and. Clearly for you, you had a pathway in mind, and what I'm curious about... No, actually, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't, actually. Right. That's, uh, you know, I actually didn't have a pathway in mind. I now have a pathway, and I have a pathway... One of the features of the International Root Cardi Research Society, for, for folks who are looking for new homes and transitions in styles, I have a wonderful pathway uh, to be able to help you. And uh, uh, the pathway is built upon certain competencies that are all uh, able to be assessed according to the criteria and tested against uh, these other competencies which lead down a pathway that gives you functional competency. That's what the pathway is about. If a pathway doesn't lead anywhere, then the, I can guarantee you one thing, it's not paved with physical conditioning or uh, intellectual uh, 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 cultivation or spiritual nurturing. And you need those three things on any pathway to conclude this even balance in the physical and the non-physical. Yep. So is that then your legacy? Is that that we all want to essentially leave this world better than the, the place that we found it? Is that how you think that you might achieve that? Is, you know, when the time comes 50 years from now that we look back and say, oh, that Patrick McCarthy guy, is that how the, the way you'd like to be remembered for leaving that behind? I'm not really concerned with that, to tell you the truth. I, I used to be very concerned with that. I want to leave an important contribution. But judging by what I, in my mid-60s, have seen about human nature, I would, and especially in our the industry part of our tradition, uh, I'm not so sure. Even if I if I if I accidentally fell over God's gift to humanity tomorrow, I'm not sure someone would even uh, leave my name associated with it down the future. That's just the ambitious and competitive nature people in the business part of what we do. Yeah, I would like to think that uh, I already feel very grateful that I have been able to help people. And those people whom I have helped have been very um, uh, vocal in uh, reassuring me that uh, they have uh, changed their opinions about things. That fits enough for me. Yeah. I'm completely happy with that. Uh, I was most concerned with being able to provide for my children. And, and enjoy life. That's, I mean, think that, I think that's, you know, one of the, I think the big secrets of life is finding out what you're good at. Yep. And then when you find out what you're good at, uh, you, you give it away to somebody else, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, but because you have to put bread on the table and pay the bills and get insurance and put people in the school, you got to make a living as well. So I don't, I don't, uh, I don't do karate to make li a living. You know, I, uh, I make a living to do karate, if you will. Yeah. And all of the 
all of the really, and I really think teachers are you know, underrated, and I think they're probably the most important mechanism, if you will, in education throughout the world, because it's, it's teachers that make tomorrow. And most teachers I know who are passionate about what they do, they don't teach, they don't teach for the income, you know, they teach for the outcome, and that's, so I, I'm happy with that. Well, I think, um, you know, from our perspective, myself and the people down in the dojo right now, you know, we're very grateful to uh, be able to share that with you who are waiting for us. So we're going to uh, wrap it up there. I, I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, uh, it's a real honor and I appreciate Tell you. Tell your uh, listeners. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, look, guys, uh, the, the amount of value in, in just a short chat like that, although not so short, I guess, um, it, it, it's just insane. So we're, we're very, very lucky to... Uh, be in this position where we can hear directly from Hunchy McCarthy and hear some of the stories that go into supporting the background of uh, what we do, supporting the background of this tradition. So uh, I hope you got as much value out of that. I know I'm going to be watching this to hear it back two or three times and make a whole bunch of notes. So uh, I recommend you do the same. Uh, thank you again, Sensei. I appreciate it so much. Thanks, and, everybody. Uh, we'll see you on the next Good video. Luck. Thank you.